Welcome to this primer to single cell protein analysis by mass spectrometry. So why should we try to do this analysis? Why shouldn't we use some of the established technologies for measuring proteins in single cells, such as those relying on affinity reagents? Uh, we can see the answer to this question in this graph that uh, we published a few years ago. And that is the fact that affinity reagents generally struggle with detection specificity. There are high quality affinity reagents, but that is not the norm. And the number of proteins, the number of epitopes that we can analyze per sample at a time with affinity reagents is generally very limited uh, from a single epitope to maybe a few dozens, maybe a hundred, but certainly not many thousands. And we were very interested to use the power of tandem mass spectrometry to increase both the specificity and the number of reliably quantified proteins and potentially proteoforms in single cells. But another major advantage of mass spectrometry analysis to analyze is the possibility to measure more than protein abundance. In particular, we might be able to measure various protein modifications. We can take advantage of having measured many proteins to quantify covariation, and from that infer regulatory relationships or analyze joint distributions. Uh, we can analyze protein localization, uh, temporal dynamics, and so on, as outlined here on this cartoon. Uh, so that is the biological motivation why we would like to, to measure proteins in, in single cells. Now, how do we do that? What is the technology for these measurements? Uh, I'll summarize for you in a very conceptualized category, uh, in a very conceptualized way, uh, the uh, different stages of the measurement and the different approaches that exist. And the first stage, of course, is sample preparation. Uh, there are different categories of methods that we and others have developed that range, range from preparing each cell into an individual tube or a container that can be miniaturized tube, for example, an autosampler auto vial, or it could be a, a, a microcentrifuge tube. Uh, of course, another option that we and others have developed is using multi-well plates. And I'll speak a little bit more about this set of approaches because they're quite accessible uh, as long as you have access to a fax sorter and a liquid handler. You can use those approaches. Even the liquid handler is optional as some people have successfully prepared cells simply using a multi-channel pipetter. So this is perhaps the most accessible uh, approach uh, for many. Another set of approaches has relied on mi microfabricated chips, which is conceptually similar to the multi-wall plates, but those microfabricated chips have smaller volumes. For uh, notably, nanopods is an example of a microfabricated chip, or more recently, N2, uh, a next advanced version of, of uh, nanopods, uh, which allows to reduce the volumes that are used for sample preparation. Uh, and another type of approach that we recently introduced is using a glass light where we eliminate the containers so that we can maximize the flexibility of positioning single cells and droplets in any geometry that is desired, and at the same time, maximizing the density of those droplets, which increases the number of cells that can be prepared at the same time with what was being demonstrated is in the low thousands, but we think this approach has the potential to, to, to be scaled to preparing tens of thousands of cells at the same time. One thing that is in common for all of these approaches that you always have to keep in mind is that sample preparation for single cell proteomics must minimize contamination. Mass spec instruments are exquisitely sensitive and there are many, many contaminants in the environment that 
are relatively lowly abundant to a bulk sample, but compared to the abundance of proteins from a single cell are highly abundant and can be very problematic. So all of these different categories uh, in one way or another try to minimize contamination by using only mass spec compatible reagents, minimizing volumes and, and so on and so forth. So that's an important common aspect of all sample preparation methods. I want to tell you a little bit more about the more accessible methods that you might be able to start with, starting with a multi-well plate that Harrison Speck, a PhD student in, in my laboratory, developed some four or five years ago now, uh, where our idea was to lice, uh, to sort single cells into multi-well plates using a fax sorter, and then lice the cells using physical methods, such as freeze and heat cycle. Uh, because we wanted to uh, minimize contamination, minimize the chemicals that we add. And there are uh, some uh, mass spec compatible detergents, such as DDM, that can be added uh, in, as part of this process. But as we developed this method, Harrison was uh, uh, very rigorous and uh, did a number of controlled experiments to demonstrate that not only that one is able to extract proteins, but that they're extracted quantitatively and stoichiometrically. And uh, he benchmarked this uh, relative to conventional well-established methods such as urea extraction. And he found that proteins are uniformly extracted from different compartments of the cell and quantification is, is accurate and precise. And the reason why I show this particular set of experiments here is to uh, to bring your attention to the fact that as you consider using a method, you should uh, look at benchmarking results for how successfully this method is extracting proteins from different compartments of the cell. Is it extracting proteins from the plasma membrane, from Golgi, from the nucleus, or is it just extracting uh, cytosolic proteins? Uh, and you should look at the reproducibility, precision, and so on. And it's important to design rigorous experiments to do that. In this case, we use metabolically labeled cultures so that we could mix and subject to the same treatment so that we can control for biases. Another similar method was introduced a few years later from Ryan Kelly's group, uh, Autopots. Uh, which again uses fax to sort single cells into multi-well plates and prepare the cells for single cell analysis uh, using relatively larger volumes. But the advantage of that is that it's easy to automate and relatively robust and accessible. I mentioned to you the possibility of preparing in parallel many thousands of single cells and want to uh, tell you briefly about, uh, about that. Uh, in particular, this involves um, depositing the cells on the surface of a glass slide. It's covered by fluorocarbon coating, which is neither hydro, uh, hydrophobic, uh, that is neither hydrophilic nor um, hydrophobic. And then each, each of these droplets serves as a reservoir in which a single cell can be prepared. And one can computationally design what is the arrangement of these droplets. In this case, Entry Duke has arranged these droplets into clusters uh, so that each cluster corresponds to the single cells that are going to be labeled as part of one TMT set. But those clusters can be easily scaled to different number of plexes as indeed we have done. And then each droplet containing a single cell can be um, uh, addressed individually with a single cell being isolated, lysed, digested, uh, labeled. And finally, all the cells are pulled automatically and the pulled samples are transferred into a multi-well plate that then can be positioned into autosampler for automated analysis. For any one method of single cell sample preparation, you'd like to have both positive and negative controls to evaluate how it's performing in your hands. And let me give you an example of some positive and some negative controls. Here on the left, you can see a positive control. Uh, 
in which we compare the intensity of peptides derived from individual cells. In this case, they were processed with NPOP, but the same principle applies to any method, to the peptide intensities from uh, a, a sample prepared in bulk using efficient method and diluted to close to single cell levels. So you can see what is the efficiency of extracting peptides, delivering peptides to the mass spec detector. In this case, it's about 95%. Now, equally important is to make sure that the analysis is not drowned in background noise. And as I mentioned, this is uh, a danger because um, single mammalian cells are small and there are many, many contaminants in the environment. So the way we like to benchmark this is by leaving certain samples or droplets in the case of NPOP without a single cell but receiving all of the chemicals and all of the treatments to which single cells are subjected. And therefore, by measuring the signal in these negative controls, here shown with the black bar, we can quantify the degree to which sample preparation has been affected by background noise. In this case, it's an exemplary situation. We see no significant background relative to the signal measured from single melanoma cells. Uh, another aspect related to the low background and the cleanliness of the analysis is suppressing the singly charged ions that are usually not peptide and can compromise uh, the, the quality of, of uh, peptide analysis. And this can be done by, again, using mass spec compatible reagents and minimizing the volumes of sample preparation. Uh, and here I show an example of the total ion current measured for singly charged ions shown in pink and multiply charged ions, which are likely to be peptides shown in cyan or blue. And you can see that the uh, ion current coming from peptides is substantially larger than the ion current coming from likely contaminants during the active gradient. And that's, that's a desirable situation. Now, the next stage, of course, after sample preparation is separation of the peptides, which can happen in liquid phase, either using liquid chromatography or using capillary electrophoresis. Uh, and of course, we can also do separation in gas phase, either using trapped ion mobility spectrometry or using FAMES. Uh, and the quality of separation allows to uh, concentrate peptides having the same sequence into, into packets that can maximize our sensitivity. And it's very, very important for achieving both deep coverage of the proteome and, and quantitative accuracy and, and precision. The good news is that there are accessible uh, and robust methods for high performance separation of peptides. There are some commercial columns that um, many laboratories have had good results with. For example, Ion Optics is one commercial uh, supplier of high quality um, liquid chromatography columns. Uh, but there are also substantial opportunities for gaining sensitivity and performance by improving separation. And the laboratory of Ryan Kelly, Ryan Kelly have, have shown this very convincingly by using columns with smaller inner diameter uh, and lower flow rates which allows to, uh, to maximize sensitivity, improve um, peptide delivery to the mass spec instruments. Um, these columns are generally not as uh, accessible and as widely robust at the moment as some of the uh, other options, but nonetheless, I think they point to an exciting uh, direction for advancing the analytical performance of single cell protein analysis, both for those of you who are interested in research, that's potentially a fruitful direction, and for those of you who are interested in applications. Furthermore, uh, I think there is uh, a good chance that these high performance separation methods will become increasingly more accessible and robust. 
Now, having done the separation of the peptides, let's move into the mass spec analysis. And there are, again, different methods and a lot of flavors and variations around similar themes that have been introduced. And I'll summarize them by categories, again, in two different ways. The first way is by the type of data acquisition. So there are, of course, data-dependent acquisition methods, or the so-called shotgun methods. And examples of data-dependent acquisition are scope MS and scope 2 methods. Um, they're also, they're, they're also label-free uh, data-independent acquisition, where a single cell can be analyzed by um, label-free DDA. Uh, there are also data-independent acquisition methods. Uh, again, one can either analyze label-free one cell at a time, or one can label peptides from different single cells with non-isobaric mass tags and analyze them via plex -GIA. There are also directed methods, as exemplified with prioritized scope, which allow to select peptides of interest uh, to be analyzed with increased sensitivity and in and to uh, uh, to increase data completeness, increase the ability to target elution peak apices uh, while working at full uh, duty cycles and also maximizing proteome coverage. The obvious uh, difference in these data acquisition methods is that when we use data independent acquisition or in general when you use wide, isolation windows, we collect data for all detectable precursors and fragments, which potentially allows us to identify um, more of the detectable peptides. And of course, a potentially here is important to emphasize because merely collecting information for precursors and fragments is insufficient for reliable sequence identification. And somewhat related to data independent acquisition is, is the recent introduction of data dependent acquisition with wide windows, but it doesn't sample the precursors quite as systematically and, and their fragments as in the case of data independent acquisition. Another way of categorizing the different methods for mass spectrometry analysis is based on the number of single cells analyzed at a time, for example, and based on the number of peptides or precursors isolated per MS2 scan. So if we don't use labels, if we use label-free methods, we can only analyze one single cell at a time, for example, and this corresponds to label-free DDA and label-free DIA analysis. Uh, when you use labels, we start being able to analyze many single cells at a time, which can help us increase throughput. And the most widely known approach for multiplexing is using, of course, isobaric mass tags, DMT. Uh, and this approach requires to isolate only one precursor at a time, at least aim for that if we want to quantify that precursor, because otherwise the co-isolated Precursors produce similar, uh, the same report orions and, and cause to have um, a superposition of intensities of the report orions, which interferes with accurate quantification. And more recently, uh, we introduced uh, non isobaric mass tags used in conjunction with a framework for um, data independent acquisition, PlexDA, which allows to analyze simultaneously. Uh, multiple single cells per sample at a time and to isolate multiple precursors for fragmentation for each MS2 scan. So with this summary of mass spec, different categories of mass spectrometry methods, uh, let me give you a high altitude overview of some important characteristics such as the quantitative accuracy and precision that you might expect, the depth of proteome coverage that we currently achieve, what is the throughput, and a little bit of a perspective on where we expect these important um, aspects to be in the future. Uh, first, I would like to emphasize that one can use a variety of different instruments 
to perform single cell protein analysis. And here you see results from two instruments separated by a decade. A top of the line TeamStuff SCP instrument and an old QExactive first generation instrument. And in this case, they're both used with FlexDOA. Uh, here you can see the duty cycles using long accumulation times and relatively few MS2 windows because this allows to maximize sensitivity with very limited samples such as single cells. And both instruments were able to quantify and identify um, a good number of peptides on a short gradient. Clearly, the identification performance of the SCP uh, instrument is superior. And similarly, uh, you can see that uh, the neural line of uh, Orbitrap instruments is superior to the QExactive basic, but you can still obtain high quality data with a variety of different instruments. And to, to, to support that point, I would actually show you on the next slides some raw data coming from the old instrument. Uh, this is how the precursors look like in single cells. In this case, we have three single cells that are labeled with non-isobaric mass tags. They're M-track in this particular case, but the particular label is not important. What's important is that it's non-isobaric, and that makes the precursors uh, whose isotopic envelopes you see here offset in M over Z space, so we can clearly detect the precursors using this old instrument from more than a decade ago. And similarly, we can detect the corresponding peptide fragments. So here, I, I, uh, I, I show exemplified data from three uh, peptides measured in single cells, either PDAC or U937 single cells. And you can see the precursor ions coil looking with their corresponding fragments. On the left is an example of a highly abundant peptide that produces robust spectra at the MS2 level in both cell types. And here on the right, you can see an example of a peptide that is very differentially abundant between those two different single cells. But nonetheless, the use of FlexDA allows to, to quantify it quite accurately in these different single cells. So that's how the single, the raw data looks like from individual cells. And you can take advantage of the fact that there are multiple uh, measurements per precursor and its fragments. And from each scan, whether MS1 or MS2 scan, you can derive estimates of relative abundance for that precursor. And then by comparing the estimates of relative abundance, one can derive a reliability estimate. In this case, the estimates are very similar, which suggests that the measurement has been accurate and reliable. Some cases they may not be, and that is very good to know that we shouldn't rely on, uh, on, on such inconsistent measurements. If we zoom out from the raw data and take a look at how the quantification looks like for hundreds of proteins, in this case, we compare the protein abundances, relative protein abundances of proteins between PDAC and Q937 cells from bulk samples, small bulk samples and individual single cells. So we see that there is a very good agreement. And the aspect that I would like to emphasize here is the dynamic range observed on both the X and the Y axis. It's about a thousand fold dynamic range of relative protein changes. And, and that's the strength of the FlexDA method that allows us to have uh, this dynamic range, which is very difficult to achieve, for example, with isobaric mass tags. So what's the protein coverage? Uh, there are so many ways of answering this question. Um, one is, what is the useful protein coverage in terms of data completeness? How many of those proteins that are quantified are consistently quantified across all single cells? What is the degree of quantification in terms of accuracy, in terms of precision, how we separate those? But to give you a ballpark estimate, uh, methods we have always aim to estimate the number of copies 
that are being sampled per single cell from the proteins. And that varies from hundreds of thousands to a few million copies of proteins being sampled per single cells, which by the way, compares very favorably to single cell RNA sequencing where one might sample thousands or maybe tens of thousands, but there are not, not a million copies of transcripts to be sampled per single cell to begin with. So that's a very favorable metric. And the coverage per cell, this is probably now a bit outdated. Uh, it can vary from a few hundred to uh, three, four thousand. I've put here two thousand to be more on the conservative side because uh, when when one detects larger number of proteins, that that tends to be associated with lower data completeness, larger cells. It's not representative. We're not going to detect three thousand proteins at the moment from a small primary T cell. We can do that from a larger uh, cell culture cell, but there is a range of a few thousand proteins that uh, distinct proteins that can be quantified per cell. Uh, and the thing that I would like to draw your attention here is the possibility to very substantially increase uh, the, the proteome coverage by improving data interpretation. Of course, there is the opportunity of if increasing it in a variety of other ways, such as improving peptide separation and ionization, that's a major opportunity and a wonderful one. But I think that even by improving data acquisition and interpretation alone with, with existing hardware, one can still improve the, the proteome coverage, especially with DI methods where data interpretation is more complex and provides more opportunities to, to improve it. So what is the throughput? The throughput is actually quite important if we want to uh, apply single cell proteomics to biological studies, especially with primary cells coming from patients. We want to be able to sample the diversity of different cell types. We want to sample cells from many different patients, different conditions, and so on. And at the moment, depending on the method used, one can analyze from a few cells per day to hundreds of cells per day. And the, we have the ability to prepare substantially more cells. So some from that perspective at the moment, sample preparation is no longer the bottleneck that it used to be. Uh, we can certainly prepare in a day easily more cells than what a single MS instrument can analyze. Uh, of course, it's not just the number of cells, it's the number of proteins that we quantify. A flow cytometer can analyze millions of cells per day, but of course it doesn't quantify many proteins. Uh, so the number of data points per day at the moment is around half a million, up to half a million data points per day. And these, the throughput of course very much depends on the degree to which we are able to multiplex, either at the level of samples or at the level of precursor analysis at MS2 level or at both levels, which can uh, give us a multiplicative gain in throughput. And indeed, uh, I think that there is a great opportunity of taking advantage of this multiplicative scaling of analyzing in parallel many samples and in parallel many precursors to help us increase the number of highly quantitative data points that we can get per unit time. And just to orient you in this graph here, the blue corresponds to using 18 plex TMT with data dependent acquisition. We can analyze only one precursor per MS2 scan. Pink corresponds to label free DIA. We can isolate multiple precursors uh, per MS2 scan, but of course, label free, it's a single sample. And what, what we have been able to do so far is to use a low plex DIA to increase it. And what we saw is that the increase was indeed multiplicative. And the projection is to um, use a much higher plex so that we can further increase the, the throughput of, of plex DIA. And that's an approach that I think holds much potential for um, scaling up the throughput of single cell proteomics. Now, having acquired the data, you'd like to analyze them. 
And this, of course, is a large topic that merits its own introduction, uh, introductory lecture. But nonetheless, I want to share with you a few thoughts and remarks. Uh, it is very common to perform dimensionality reduction with um, single cell data. And uh, that's something that has to be done carefully. So here, uh, what, what I'm showing is three-dimensional data that has this complicated shape in 3D space. And if we apply different methods for dimensionality reduction, you can see that we are able to obtain projections that capture some aspects of the original higher dimensional data. This is just going from three to two dimensions, but they clearly don't capture all aspects. Some aspects of the data are being lost. And this potential of losing aspects of the data and distorting them is even higher when, when we work with much higher dimensional data. Uh, so as a result, I would suggest that when we interpret low dimensional projections, we also verify that our interpretations, our conclusions are supported by the high dimensional data. And here I'll, I'll give you one example of how we have done that in the past. So in this case, we have a low dimensional projection of cells analyzed by single cell RNA sequencing, 10x genomics. Those are the gray data points. And on the top, we have low dimensional projections of scope 2 data, protein data, cells analyzed by scope 2. And we can see that the protein clusters appear to be tighter than the RNA clusters, but we didn't trust the low dimensional projection because this impression could be due to um, having more cells analyzed by 10x um, genomics, or it could be due to some other aspect of not capturing the low dimensional projection, not capturing equally well the full amount of variance present in each data set. So then what we did to evaluate it was to compute the pairwise similarities, such as correlations, between cells within a cell type, both for the RNA and for the protein, and we could see that the similarity within a cell type is indeed higher for the cells analyzed by scope two, which suggested that in this case, the low dimensional projection interpretation is consistent with the high dimensional data, but that may not always be the case. So performing this check is, is a good measure to, to avoid uh, making an incorrect inference. Uh, I would like to uh, share with you resources for helping you get started, both with performing the analysis and analyzing the data. And in particular, if you have not yet generated your own data, but you want to um, get a sense of what the data look like and start analyzing, uh, you, can, you can go to this web portal from which you can download data from our previous studies along with the metadata and uh, try your hand at reanalyzing them. Also, another resource that we recently developed working with many of the leaders in, in the community is a white paper, a uh, forthcoming publication in Nature Methods that provides initial recommendations, guidance on how to perform single cell protein analysis. And in, in this white paper, we discuss uh, both the experimental and the computational aspects of, of the experiments. Uh, you can find the resource website from this URL here, singlecell.net slash guidelines. Uh, and if you have suggestions, recommendations, we very much welcome those. You can also find the Google form where you can enter your suggestions. I'll stop here and I'll welcome your questions.